A Republican senator says a whistleblower is preparing to spill the beans on the Bidens. Joe prepares to spend even more money as the expert. Happy talk the economy. And the Church of England endorses same-sex marriage. I'm Ben Shapiro. This is The Ben Shapiro Show. So Joe Biden is preparing his 2024 race or his 2024 hobble or his 2024 gradual crawling toward the finish line. And that means that he's attempting to rejigger his entire administration around new messaging. In 2020, his message was basically Donald Trump is terrible and evil. In 2024, his message is going to have to be something different. He's going to have to actually expand his message in an attempt to broaden his base. The Democratic coalition in 2020 was essentially upper crust white liberals who had graduated college and poor minorities, and then a bunch of people who were really disillusioned with Donald Trump. But if Trump isn't on the ballot, and right now the polls show that Donald Trump is actually not the front runner for the Republican nomination, that he is fading pretty poor, pretty badly here. If that's the case, Joe Biden knows he's going to have to earn more votes than he did last time in order for him to be able to win re-election. And make no mistake, he is running. I mean, he has decided that he is all in despite all of the Democratic angst and heartburn over whether or not an 80-year-old man should be running for president of the United States. He will do it, even if he is 82 years old at the time that he would enter his second term. But there are some obstacles lying in the way for Joe Biden. One is corruption and the other is his own incompetence. So when it comes to the corruption angle, people seem to forget that there are a couple of scandals that seem to be kind of lurking out there for Joe Biden. One, of course, is the classified document scandal. The fact that he is now out there openly admitting that he's had classified documents since like 1974 in his place. And that in and of itself isn't a huge scandal considering how many politicians have been caught up in classified documents issues in just the last couple of years, ranging from Donald Trump to Mike Pence to Joe Biden. But it does raise questions as to his judgment. And it raises even more questions as to how his administration attempted to cover up news of the classified documents prior to the 2022 elections. There will be investigations about that. But there are other investigations that are ongoing. So yesterday, Senator Chuck Grassley, Republican from Iowa, testified on Thursday before the House's new select subcommittee on political weaponization. And he said there have now been whistleblower disclosures indicating that the FBI has evidence that Joe Biden is aware of his family's business schemes. So you'll recall that the Biden family is a corrupt crime family that Hunter Biden travels around the world picking up sacks of cash, which he then uses apparently on prostitutes and and cocaine and meth. And he does so on the basis of his father's name. He did it for years at a time. And you'll recall that on his computer, there were messages about 10% for the big guy. And there, there were texts in which he talked about how he was paying all of Joe's bills and all the rest of this, which raised serious questions as to whether Joe Biden, when he was vice president of the United States, was benefiting from his son going around picking up bags of cash from foreign sources. So that was question number one. Joe Biden also has brothers, like his brother James, who apparently travels around the country dropping his brother's name in order to secure particular contracts with a promise that there will be some sort of connection made with Joe Biden. Now, that is, in fact, misuse of government resources if Joe Biden is aware of that or if he is getting a cut of that or if he is benefiting in any way from all of that. And so these are the sorts of investigations that are going to take place now. Joe Biden escaped the scrutiny of the media in 2020 because he was running against Donald Trump. And that was really the only time anyone was going to investigate Joe Biden, because why would you investigate the vice president? No one cares about the vice president. Is anybody investigating Kamala Harris right now? She's boring and and the office itself isn't worth a warm bucket of spit in the famous words of John Adams. But now Joe Biden is president. In 2020, media weren't going to investigate this at all. They still would prefer not to investigate it. They prefer to poo-poo all of this. But Republicans do actually control the House. The thing Democrats were afraid of and Republicans taking the House were all of these investigative subcommittees. So now Senator Chuck Grassley is actually testifying that there is a whistleblower who may come forward with evidence that Joe Biden knew that his family was participating in these schemes. Here was Senator Grassley yesterday. Further allegations to my office involved FBI personnel at the Washington field office who improperly ordered information to be closed by the FBI related to Hunter Biden's potential criminal conduct in October 2020, just before the election, even though it was verified or it was verifiable. Other whistleblower disclosures to my office make clear that the FBI has within its uh, possession very significant, impactful, and voluminous evidence with respect to potential criminal conduct by Hunter and James Biden. And Grassley went on to say these disclosures also allege that Joe Biden was aware of Hunter Biden's business arrangements and may have been involved in some of them. So, This raises questions not only about the Bidens, by the way, but also about the FBI. Why does it take FBI whistleblowers in order to 
let Chuck Grassley know about this? Why isn't the FBI actually being transparent about any of this? Now, you can say, well, they're doing so for investigative purposes, that you know, they're, they're, they really try to be opaque. They try to be a black box while an investigation is in progress in order not to bias the case. I'd have a lot more trust in that if they weren't selectively leaking about Donald Trump every five seconds during the Trump administration, which is what they did. They spent every single day finding ways to leak about Donald Trump. It's amazing how the quote unquote deep state leaks to the benefit of Democrats repeatedly, but suddenly they clam up and they are absolutely opaque when it comes to when it comes to Democrats. It's, it's an amazing, amazing thing. So these sorts of revelations could be coming. And if they are coming, that is a real problem for Joe Biden. And there could be an attached scandal, nonetheless, with regard to the FBI, because it turns out that the FBI's corruption is very real. Whistleblower documents uncovered by the Heritage Foundation, the Daily Signal, show that the FBI, for example, the Richmond office repeatedly cited the Southern Poverty Law Center, which is a far left smear factory in an intelligence bulletin attempting to label certain groups extremists. It was the FBI, of course, that was laundering into public view the Steele dossier via James Comey. So the twin problems of Hunter and Joe Biden's corruption, James Biden's corruption, the possibility of Joe's involvement in all of that, plus FBI malfeasance is going to lead to tremendous mistrust not only in the FBI, but into the veracity of any investigation into Joe Biden, which means that these investigative subcommittees are going to become very important in short order. You know what else is very important? Protecting your online privacy, because a lot of the same sources that are protecting Democrats, well, they like to keep an eye on you. They like to make sure that, that they are monitoring what you do. Big tech is working hand in glove with big government. Both of them like to grab your data and use it against you. Why would you allow them to do that? Instead, you ought to go check out ExpressVPN. I use ExpressVPN to protect my network from being monitored, and you should do the same thing. Your ISP can keep logs of your internet activity. With ExpressVPN, your internet activity is completely hidden. All it takes is one easy tap of a button for ExpressVPN to secure all of your devices. It's really easy to use. One reason I love ExpressVPN, it doesn't slow down my device when I'm using it. You click one button, it downloads. You click another button, you are now protected. Why would you want hackers to have access to your data or big tech or big government? Stop letting the government spy on you. Take back your privacy and your freedom at expressvpn.com slash Ben. Get three extra months for free. That's E-X-P-R-E-S-S VPN.com slash Ben. To get this special offer for my listeners, expressvpn.com slash Ben. Go check them out right now. That's expressvpn.com slash Ben. Again, the, the twin scandals of Joe Biden's actual activity with regard to his own family, plus a law enforcement mechanism that is run top down by people like Merrick Garland at the Department of Justice, that could really come back to haunt Joe Biden. And he, he knows it, which is why he's speaking through lawyers right now. It's also why he's avoiding interviews like the plague. So you will recall that every Super Bowl Sunday, it's now become a presidential tradition. The president holds a pre-Super Bowl interview with the network that is airing the Super Bowl. Barack Obama used to do it all the time. You remember that Barack Obama was interviewed by Bill O'Reilly at one point, right? This sort of thing had sort of become a tradition, but Joe Biden will never be interviewed by an unfriendly source. He will only be interviewed by friendlies. This is why when you hear folks in the media yell about Donald Trump, he won't sit down with CNN or Ron DeSantis. Why won't he talk to the legacy media? Well, you guys started it. According to Joe Biden and his office, he has not yet committed to a pre-Super Bowl interview with Fox News, a move that suggests the Democrat may buck the tradition of granting the network broadcasting the big game an interview. According to CNN Business, we don't have a formal no, but we're operating like it's not happening. The person familiar with the matter explained to CNN on Thursday evening. Biden has sat down with two interviews this week, but one was with PBS NewsHour, Judy Woodruff, who is an ally, and the other was with Telemundo, which is another allied network. Biden has not granted Fox News a single interview during his presidency, despite the network repeatedly asking. According to CNN, quote, that's likely due to how the right-wing channel portrays him and his administration with extremists like Tucker Carlson regularly launching vicious attacks on him. Uh, I don't remember you guys having exactly the same kind of excuse making when it was Donald Trump who was rejecting your interviews. And I was like, why won't he listen to us? Why won't he talk to us? We're the objective journalismers. Uh, here's the deal. If you're the president of the United States, you probably should do interviews with all sorts of sources and you should be unafraid of walking into the fire. But Joe Biden is afraid and he should be afraid because frankly, he's not doing a very good job. And when he's asked even remotely difficult questions, he bridles. So yesterday, for example, Joe Biden was asked by Telemundo about bringing down the Chinese spy balloon. Why did he wait so long to bring down the Chinese spy balloon? And he immediately launched into an answer about how he was afraid that it would hit a house. Uh, dude, Montana is big and there are two people in the whole state. The, the, the notion that you were deeply afraid that if you shot down the Chinese spy balloon, that was really what was up at play here, is that they could only bring it down and not kill somebody if they were doing it over the ocean. It's just nonsense. Here was Joe Biden's answer. Do you regret not having insisted 
on bringing it down sooner. No, I look at the expert, the intelligence community, the defense community. They forgot more about it than you or I know. I said I wanted to shut down as soon as possible. And they were worried about the damage that could be done even in a big state like Montana. This thing was gigantic. What happened if it came down and hit a school? Yeah, not particularly convincing. Okay, so again, the, the twin threats to Joe Biden's 2024 campaign are one, corruption, and that is very much an alive question. And two, is his own incompetence. And so he has to shift. And his shift is going to be toward spending more money. Oodles and oodles and oodles of money. He's going to run the John Edwards campaign in 2004. He's going to run the Barack Obama campaign, not from 2012, but from 2008. He's going to go back to the well and he's going to start running the old Democrat playbook. Now, it's actually relatively clever because one thing that Joe Biden has noticed that intersectionality is not playing well with the flyover states, the so-called flyover states. Like the Rust Belt is not interested in Joe Biden's brand of equity and transing the kids. People don't like that stuff very much. So instead, he is going to angle himself toward, what if I just give you boatloads of money? What if I just yell about entitlements? And this is pretty safe territory for Democrats. It really is. Now, I think they're going to have a tough time squaring this circle because I think that the quasi-socialist, redistributionist Democrat Bernie Sanders program does not live all that comfortably with the wokest. The wokest believe that they have grabbed control of the steering wheel in this kind of weird clown car that is the Democratic Party. And I'm not sure they're going to give it up all that easily. Remember that it seemed like in 2016, Bernie Sanders was on the rise and Bernie was going to take it from Hillary because he was running from the socialistic left. And what actually killed him is the wokest coming in from his left and saying, well, you don't care enough about race. You don't care enough about the social issues. You don't care enough about the, the key issues, about human happiness. And it really clocked Bernie upside the head. And ever since Bernie has been kind of wandering in the wilderness, Joe Biden has had, had to pay all sorts of homage to the radical left during the 2020 campaign. He had to do it over and over and over again. He had to go soft on the defund the police movement, for example, right? He was, he was fairly quiet about that. He Every so often he would sort of tut tut them, but at the same time, he was declaring the police systemically racist. He, he had to go very soft on the social policy sort of stuff, right? He was talking in radical terms about abortion and transgenderism and trans kids and all the rest of this sort of stuff. But you'll notice in the State of the Union address this week that he did something else. He front-loaded all the econ talk and he back-loaded all the other stuff. So he backloaded foreign policy where he's weak. He backloaded all of the dramatically radical social issues that the base really loves because he knows he's now secured the base, right? I mean, no one's going to run against him in a primary, realistically speaking, unless he has some sort of tremendous health failure. So instead, what he's going to run on is a kind of two-pronged campaign. One is, I will spend more money than you have ever seen. And two is, Republicans will stop me from spending more money than you have ever seen. These are the twin prongs. Now, you may say to yourself, wait a second, wasn't spending all of this money how we got 6.5% inflation last month and elevated prices on everything over the course of the last two years, like record inflation? Isn't that how we got here is because you spent too much money? The answer, of course, is yes. But Joe Biden is relying on, I, I think, a slim chance that there's a quote unquote soft landing and he's relying on his friends in the media to recapitulate what exactly is happening in the economy. So instead of there being talk about stagnation, which is what we are about to hit, there'll be talk about a soft landing. They've, they've now lowered the bar for economic growth so much that as long as there's not an outright negative growth recession, the media will declare that everything is hunky-dory and Joe Biden did a fine and fabulous job. And so you're starting to see the New York Times prep the ground. You have to understand that pretty much all media coverage right now is push polls. So push polls are a kind of poll that is done in political campaigns where the goal isn't to actually measure what people think about a, a given issue. The actual goal is to push people on that issue. So somebody will call you up on the phone and they'll ask you a question like, don't you think Donald Trump is a racist? Now, they're not actually attempting to garner whether you think Donald Trump is a racist or not. The idea is to push you into thinking about Donald Trump and racism. It is a push poll. It's done very often right before election campaigns. The same thing is being done by the media now. Their coverage is no longer coverage. It is push coverage. It's an attempt to push you into believing a thing by pretending that they're objective journalism. Perfect example from the New York Times with regards to the economy today. And this is going to be the going theme for a while. But speaking of the economy, if you're looking at the future of American growth and you're thinking to yourself, man, look at that national debt. I mean, it's like $32 trillion. And look at the future of spending in America. It's not going to slow down anytime soon. You're thinking inflation will probably be back. High taxation will come. Maybe you should hedge your bets just a little bit by getting some of your money into precious metals. Those have been the best store of value in human history. And that's particularly true with gold. Gold will withstand inflation, geopolitical turmoil, and stock market crashes. And Birch Gold can help you convert some of your IRA or 401k into an IRA in precious metals. They can help you get some of your assets into 
hard assets like precious metals. I'm not saying take everything you own and then buy gold bars and bury them in backyards. I'm talking about diversification as a strategy. It is a smart thing to do. Talk to the experts at Birch Gold. They've got an A-plus rating with the Better Business Bureau. Thousands of happy customers. Countless five-star reviews. Text Ben to 989898. Claim your free info kit on gold today. Then talk to one of their precious metals specialists. Text Ben again to 989898. And when you do, get all your questions answered and then invest some of your money with Birch Gold the same way that I do. Again, text Ben to 989898 to claim your free info kit on gold today. Okay, so speaking of push coverage, the New York Times has an article today titled, What Recession? Some Economists See Chances of a Growth Rebound. Now, you can always find economists to say nearly anything. I mean, there, there were stories in the New York Times for years before the inflation surge from the quote-unquote experts suggesting that inflation would never come. I mean, people like Gabriel Saez, who was a who was a econ advisor to Elizabeth Warren, was suggesting that modern monetary theory was going to put us in the driver's seat in terms of the global economy. And turns out that you can find experts to say pretty much anything. When, when, when the media say some experts, what they really mean is we think. And then they go and they find a couple of obscure professors somewhere to suggest that things are, are exactly as they think they are going to be. Right? It's push coverage. So here's what the New York Times says. Many economists and investors had a clear narrative coming into 2023. The Federal Reserve had spent months pushing borrowing costs rapidly higher in a bid to tame inflation. Those moves were expected to slow growth and the labor market so much that the economy would be at risk of plunging into a downturn. But the recession calls are now getting a rethink. Are they, though? Employers added more than half a million jobs in January. The housing market shows signs of stabilizing or even picking back up. Many Wall Street economists have marked down the odds of a downturn this year. After months of asking whether the Fed could pull off a soft landing in which the economy slows but does not plummet into a bruising recession, analysts are raising the possibility it will not land at all. That growth will simply hold up. Now, buried in, um, in paragraph four here is some of the data. Quote, not every data point looks sunny. Manufacturing remains glum. Consumer spending has been cracking. Some analysts still think a mild recession this year remains likely. But there have been enough surprises pointing to continued momentum that Fed officials themselves seem to see a better chance the nation will avoid a painful downturn, that resilience could even be a problem. Economists are beginning to ask whether growth and the job market will run too warm for inflation to slow as more central bankers are hoping, eventually forcing the Fed to respond more aggressively. So in other words, what they're actually saying is it's not going to be a soft landing. The inflation is just going to remain high. That's not a landing at all. I mean, that's the inflation still at high rates, which means the Federal Reserve will, in fact, have to jack up the interest rates until the economy slows. That is what's going to have to happen here. And then the aftermath of that, because of Joe Biden's regulatory and spending policy, is going to be slow growth. I keep coming back to this fact, but it is true. When Joe Biden became president and he put out his economic forecast for the next decade or so, his suggestion was that we would have hot growth for a couple of years, and then we would have growth at below 2% year on year, pretty much every year from now into infinity. That is not good, guys. That is stagnation. But Joe Biden is going to proclaim that his stagnation is, uh, is actually the solution. And not only that, he's going to claim that everything that he's doing is working. That, that was the suggestion of the State of the Union, is that everything is actually going gonzo. It's going absolutely fabulously. Meanwhile, again, the interest rates are likely to jack up. John C. Williams, president of the Federal Reserve Bank of New York, indicated on Wednesday quarter point moves were likely to remain the norm. He suggested rates might even have to adjust by more if demand and price increases stay elevated. He said demand in our economy is much stronger right now than you might expect in a regular pre-pandemic situation. How high rates must climb in order to be sufficiently restrictive has got to be influenced by that. But one of the things that is going to force the interest rates up is, of course, more spending. So Joe Biden has to lie to you. He has to suggest that everything is hunky-dory. Don't look at the inflation rate. Don't look at the future of the economy. Don't look at the future of those interest rates. Instead, look around and be happy and just and think that you want more of this. So that is prong number one. Right, prong number one is we are going to give you more of what you've already had, and we are going to, and you're going to love it. It's going to be amazing. Paul Krugman is doing this routine again. A, a man who once declared that the internet would have no impact on the American economy. Paul Krugman. He was he's been right about like some trade policy, which is the reason why he won a Nobel in economics, and um, and he's been wrong about literally everything else the rest of his entire career. But Paul Krugman has an article today suggesting that Democrats are in fact not radical on nearly anything. He, uh, he, he suggests that, that Joe Biden's economic program is wildly popular and that Republicans are the ones who are truly radical. That, and, and this gets him to, to his actual agenda. The actual agenda of the Democrats is not even the spending. They're not going to get as much spending as they wanted before because Republicans now control the House of Representatives. This brings us to prong two of Joe Biden's incipient campaign, and that is Republicans are going to cut Social Security and Medicare. Now, unfortunately, that is a lie. Republicans are not going to cut Social Security and they are not going to cut Medicare and they are certainly not going to do so while Joe Biden is president. The simple, the reason I say unfortunately is because 
a train is coming down the tracks and it is the failure of Social Security and Medicare. These are giant Ponzi schemes. And eventually the bill is going to come due. In fact, we know that in the next decade, there's going to be serious insolvency problems with Social Security as well as Medicaid, unless you radically increase taxes, with, say a value added tax, which nobody wants, or you radically scale up income taxes for the middle class and the lower classes. Yes, because it turns out they can't tax those rich people enough to pay for all of this. Right? The, the, that train is coming down the tracks and everybody knows it. We are demographically upside down in this country. We have too many old people and not enough young people to pay the bills for those old people. Social security is kicking in at 65. The average life expectancy in the United States right now is about 80, which means that you have paid enough money for about two or three years of social security income, but you have not paid in enough money for 15 years of social security income. But Democrats are screaming and shouting that we can't raise the retirement age. So we are going to politic ourselves directly into a fiscal crisis, which is the same thing that Europe has done over and over and over again. But Joe Biden is going to is going to politic off of that because kicking the can down the road is a fantastic way of campaigning. We'll get to that in a moment. First, speaking of life expectancy, you know, the good news is that in the United States, life expectancy is still hovering around the age of 80. But that doesn't mean that you know what's coming around that next corner. In fact, literally what could be coming around that next corner is a watermelon truck that runs you down. Well, as those watermelons are coming at you, you think to yourself, man, should have listened to Shapiro and gotten myself some life insurance. It is the smart thing. It is the responsible thing to do. Policy Genius makes it easy to compare life insurance quotes from top companies and find your lowest price. With Policy Genius, you can find life insurance policies that start at just 39 bucks per month for 2 million bucks in coverage. Some options offer coverage in as little as a week and avoid those unnecessary medical exams. Policy Genius's licensed agents can help you find coverage options in as little as a week. They work for you, not the insurance companies, which means they don't have an incentive to recommend one insurer over another so you can actually trust their guidance. There are no added fees. Your personal information remains private. Your loved ones deserve that financial safety net and you deserve a smarter way to find and buy it. Head on over to policygenius.com slash Shapiro or click the link in the description to get your free life insurance quotes and see how much you could save. That is policygenius.com slash Shapiro, policygenius.com slash Shapiro. So here is Joe Biden demagoguing the issues of Social Security and Medicare in rather nonsensical fashion because everything the man says is now nonsensical since he is on the verge of senility. We saw on Tuesday night Republicans don't like me being called out on this. They were not very happy with me pointing this out. But there were speak. Look, I know that a lot of Republicans, their dream is to cut Social Security and Medicare. Well, let me say this. If that's your dream, I'm your nightmare. Well, I mean, he is definitely a nightmare, but I, I, I you know, the, the deep irresponsibility of so many people in politics, which is what if we just pretend that a problem that obviously is looming is not looming? And then we yell at people who, who notice that the problem is looming. It really is amazing. So what you hear from Joe Biden is that Social Security and Medicare, there must never be any changes to Social Security, Medicare, Medicaid, any of these, quote unquote, entitlement programs. Never any changes to that. That disaster, by the way, is looming within the decade. But the greatest threat facing you and your family is not the insolvency of some of the nation's most important entitlement programs. The greatest threat facing you is that in 100 years, it's going to be slightly warmer outside. That is the greatest threat facing you. In fact, we have to restructure the entire American economy today in order to account for the possible threat of global warming 100 years from now. But Social Security and Medicare, the, these things, they will never go insolvent. And in fact, if you even talk about them, this means that they're, this means that you're a crazy person. Now, Zachary Wolf, writing for CNN, points out that Medicare and Social Security insolvency is directly around the corner. President Biden, he says, is accusing Republicans of wanting to cut Social Security and Medicare. He says he will protect these key pillars of the social safety net. But the reality is that Medicare hospital insurance is already running out of money. In their annual report released last June, Medicare's trustees reported the hospital insurance trust fund will bring in $412 billion in 2023 and it will spend $416 billion. So it's going to spend $3 billion more than it generates in revenue. The hospital insurance trust fund will be completely gone by 2028 which means the government has to do something. And meanwhile, Social Security is running out of money as well. The financial outlook of Social Security is a bit different than it is for Medicare, says CNN, and this is CNN. The cost of Social Security funded through payroll taxes began to be higher than its income in 2021. It will be higher in all future years. So we are already running in the red on Social Security, like today. Two Social Security trust funds, both of which own U.S. debt in the form of treasuries, should cover costs for the next decade. The trust fund that pays checks to seniors will be depleted in 2034. Starting in 2035, Social Security would only be able to pay 77% of benefits without government action. And by the way, the CBO has that estimate at 2033. 
which means that there are only a few things that can be done. You have to either reduce benefits or you have to increase taxes or you have to raise the retirement age. These are the only things that can be done. But Joe Biden is going to demagogue the situation. He's going to pretend that it's not a crisis in any way. And he's probably going to get away with it because the truth is that in the end, the American taxpayer does not want to face the consequences of our own fiscal irresponsibility. Democrats know this, which is why they keep running on it. And again, this is why you have push journalism. Why, this is why you have push coverage from, from the Washington Post. Quote, GOP hopefuls past positions on Social Security loom over 2024 primary. So now we're going to just have a debate over Social Security and Medicare, even though no one is actually talking about doing anything serious about it and hasn't been talking about it, unfortunately, since about 2006. It was about 2004 when George W. Bush was reelected that he talked about privatizing certain portions of Social Security, guaranteeing that everybody who already, already was in Social Security would get their money out. But if you were nearing retirement age, instead of you paying your payroll tax into the government, you could take that and put it in the stock market, for example. And he got yelled off the stage and then Democrats won in 2006. And that was kind of the end of the conversation. Paul Ryan, when he was Speaker of the House, tried to do something, complete fail. It didn't go anywhere with a Republican president. So realistically speaking, we are just going to, it's going to be the, the train in Back to the Future 3 over Eastwood Ravine. I mean, this thing is going off the rails and ain't nobody going to stop it. But the media are going to push the idea that Republicans cannot be elected because they might try to stop that train from going off the rails. Sadly, they are wrong. No one's going to try to stop this train from going off the rails. Donald Trump has been demagoguing this thing with Ron DeSantis, suggesting that he's not going to cut Social Security, but you know who will? Is it Ron DeSantis? Our politicians are irresponsible because they lie to us to tell us the things that we want to hear. But this is part of Joe Biden's actual routine circa 2024. Henry Olson, who is more of a big government Republican writing for the Washington Post, he says that this is actually going to work from Joe Biden. He says President Biden is trying to steal Republican thunder when it comes to appealing to working class Americans. If the GOP wants to win in future elections, it can't let this happen. It must present its own viable blend of populism to counter Joe Biden's. Biden's brand of America First was evident throughout his speech. He highlighted his administration's efforts to boost manufacturing in the United States and other issues important to U.S. workers, such as protecting government entitlement programs. Conservatives should be responding with the United Front. Instead, they are engaging in an increasingly acrimonious debate on economic policy. The economic arguments, says Henry Olson, in this debate are varied and complex. The political arguments are simpler and perhaps ultimately more important. It comes down to this. Does the Republican Party need to embrace some degree of economic nationalism and populism to secure its newfound base in working class voters of all races and nationalities? Now, yeah, I, I think, again, this is Henry Olson, who is a big government Republican, sort of doubling down on his agenda. He thinks that the reason that Republicans won in 2016 is because Donald Trump was a big government conservative, meaning that he was in favor of some socially conservative policies, although not all that many. He was, was anti-woke, but he was into tariffs and he was into big government spending and all the rest of it. I'm not sure that that is actually the path to electoral victory, but he is not wrong that Joe Biden running against cutting entitlement programs will likely be a success. And again, it's deeply dishonest. The same people who declare that Social Security and Medicare are not in crisis are now suggesting that climate change and global issues ought to be handled by the World Bank because it's such a crisis. This is why you have Janet Yellen, the current U.S. Treasury Secretary, who I, I thought was actually the U.S. Treasury Secretary. Like, she's supposed to be concerned with the fact that she's done a terrible job and inflation is at 6.5%. And remember, she was the Federal Reserve Chair until five minutes ago. So just everybody keeps failing upward. Here she was trying to push the World Bank to be bolder on climate change. These are the priorities. The bank must be bolder and more imaginative in its operational approach. For example, we know that subnational entities can sometimes have greater expertise and willingness to implement innovative projects. So what if we made it easier for cities to gain access to funding for climate smart urban infrastructure? And this is what they're going to run on, on the global scale. Now, again, is this going to be successful from Joe Biden, this sort of populist push? I have my doubts. I think that the wokes are going to push him into line eventually. I think that the, the social issues are still a killer for the Democrats. The social issues that they want you not to talk about are still a killer for the Democrats. But you can see that what Biden is doing is actually relatively intelligent for what is left in his feeble brain, or at least the people around him know that they need to make that sort of move. They also know that they need to, at all costs, of course, avoid Kamala Harris being the candidate. They're going to have to prop this old man up until he is no longer literally capable of doing this because Kamala Harris continues to be Kamala Harris. Yesterday, another deep thought with Kamala Harris. And now, deep thoughts with Kamala Harris. 
Yeah, here she was yesterday. She she loves her electric school buses. I don't know when the remit of the vice presidency became electric school buses, but here we go. Cities and towns with electric fleets spend less on gas and maintenance. And as some of the leaders here can attest, that means more money in the local budget to add more routes, more stops, and more drivers. And that means more reliable service. So, you know, for anyone who's had to wait too long in the cold because the bus is late, you know how much that matters. All of this to say, electric buses are key to the future of public transportation in America. Oh man, you excited about the electric buses? They need Joe Biden in that office as long as humanly possible. Now, one of the things that I've said here is that I think that as much as Joe Biden would like to steer back toward the economic issues, he'd like to go back toward sort of Clintonian third wayism with much, much bigger government. He'd like to go back to FDR kind of policies. This is where he feels his sweet spot is. I'm not sure that his own party is going to allow him to do that. And the reason is because they actually have a religious worldview. And that, that religious worldview is no longer chiefly economic. They're no longer into the Elizabeth Warren brand of Democratic Party politics. They are more into the religious component of wokeness. I don't think that's going away anytime soon. I think everybody on the right who's sort of saying, well, wokeness is starting to fit. I think that you are happy talking yourselves. I do not think that, that is the case whatsoever. And it's an actual religious worldview now. You know, to pretend that, that left-wing progressivism on social issues is merely a sort of outgrowth of normal secularism is not true. It forces you to believe things that are actively untrue. And it is, in fact, a form of religion. It's one of the reasons why, for example, you've seen the infiltration of secular leftist worldviews on social issues infused into progressive churches. Now, people say these aren't churches anymore. That's wrong. They are churches. They are progressive churches. Churches to progressivism or churches to transgressivism, which is why you're seeing more and more videos of churches themselves turning themselves into altars on behalf of left-wing social values. So, for example, there's a video going around yesterday of a pastor suggesting the drag queen story hour affirms what they are as a church. I, this is on CNN. I, I don't see this as uh, particularly shocking, actually. The bingo event itself wasn't initially part of the lesson, but I imagine it's become part of a really important lesson, not only for your congregation, but for the community as well, Reverend. Yeah, and, and I do, I do, I do want to say that the, the, the positive response and the generosity of response that we enjoyed with this event was extraordinary. It's unlike anything that I've ever experienced. I, I do think that the overall um, uh, experience was extremely positive. Uh, it was an affirmation of who we are as a church, um, how we think about the commandment to love our neighbor. Rev that is Reverend Todd Better over at a church in Connecticut being, being featured on CNN because they're all part of the same religious community. And that religious community isn't going to go away. The religion of woke leftism, of radical gender theory leftism, it's not going to go away. They're going to demand their pound of flesh when it comes to national politics. Joe Biden ain't going to be able to escape that. It's going to come up over and over again in the campaign. And he's going to try to redirect over to Social Security and Medicare. It ain't going to work. This is a broad international movement, by the way, this this religious movement, the secular religious movement, because it is, in fact, a pagan religion of its own, has now infused into major church institutions. The left is great at this. They take over institutions and they wield those institutions as sort of meat puppets on behalf of their viewpoint. This is why, for example, the Church of England just voted in favor of blessings for same sex unions. According to the UK Guardian, Church of England priests will be permitted to bless the civil marriages of same-sex couples in a profound shift in the church's stance on homosexuality after a historic vote by its governing body. The first blessings for gay couples should happen this summer. Individual churches will be encouraged to state clearly whether they will offer blessings to avoid confusion and disappointment. After an impassioned debate lasting more than eight hours, the Church of England's National Assembly, the Church Synod, voted by 250 votes to, to 181 to back a proposal by bishops intended to end years of painful divisions and disagreement over sexuality. But emotionally charged speeches from those advocating full equality for LGBTQ plus minus divided by a sign, happy face emoji Christians, and those arguing that traditional biblical teaching on marriage and sex must be upheld, signaled the debate is set to continue. The Synod also agreed the church will apologize for the harm it has caused to LGBTQ people and welcomed a forthcoming review of a ban on clergy entering into same-sex civil marriages themselves and a celibacy rule for clergy in same-sex relationships. Conservatives narrowly succeeded in amending the motion to state that it was church's doctrine of marriage between a man and a woman was unchanged. But they are still get allowing blessings. And the archbishop said, quote, for the first time, the Church of England will publicly, unreservably, and joyfully welcome same-sex couples in church. 
Hey, this obviously has nothing to do with historical traditional Christianity or biblical belief. I mean, it is a direct rejection of that. Historical Judeo-Christian belief, biblical belief, suggests that homosexual acts are a sin. But secular worldview has now infused all of these institutions. And the idea is that if you say that certain activity is a sin and certain people have a predilection for this kind of activity, this means that you are intolerant and bigoted toward those people, which of course runs directly contra the basic premise of religion, which is that you are in charge of your own activity no matter the temptation and that life is a struggle with temptation and we all fall short and we all fail. But that's what religion is. It's a demand to do things that you don't necessarily want to do on behalf of a higher morality. The Church of England has now been taken over by the cult of authenticity, the cult of secular left-wing authenticity and transgressivism. And you're going to see this increasingly because to pretend that what's happening on the left here with regard to social policy is not in fact a religion is to ignore what it is. It is a cult that requires, in some cases, human sacrifice. We'll get to that in just one second. First, if you are talking about how to better your company, and you should be these days, because as I say, the economy, I don't think it's going to be going great guns for very much longer here. You need better employees. You need to upgrade your efficiency. This is why you need Zip Recruiter. If you're hiring, there's technology that can quickly help you find the right person for your role. That's ZipRecruiter's matching technology. Right now, you can try it for free at ZipRecruiter.com slash Daily Wire. ZipRecruiter uses powerful technology to find the right candidates for your job. If you see a candidate you like, you can easily send them a personal invite so they are more likely to apply. And if you're really looking to catch somebody's eye, ZipRecruiter offers attention-grabbing labels that speak to job flexibility like urgent or remote. Find candidates you're crazy about with ZipRecruiter. Four out of five employers who post on ZipRecruiter will get a quality candidate within day one. See for yourself. Go to ZipRecruiter.com slash Daily Wire. Try ZipRecruiter for free. Again, at ZipRecruiter.com slash D-A-I-L-Y-W-I-R-E. ZipRecruiter is indeed the smartest way to hire. Again, go check out ZipRecruiter. We use ZipRecruiter here at Daily Wire ourselves to find the best possible employees, and you should do the same. ZipRecruiter.com slash Daily Wire to try out ZipRecruiter for free today. Also, to celebrate President's Day this year, you mean George Washington's birthday, the Daily Wire is launching our President's for Sale sale with 40% off new annual memberships. The big guy apparently got 10%. We are giving you 40%. Joe Biden would sell the country for way less than that. Get access to the world of Daily Wire Plus with fearless documentaries, gripping movies, Dennis Prager's The Master's Program, and the entire library of Dr. Jordan Peterson's work, including new productions like Exodus, Logos and Literacy, and On Marriage, all available to watch right now. Coming down the pipeline to a TV or laptop near you, new episodes of my show, The Search, Exodus Part 2, in which I appear, our much-anticipated DW Kids content, and later this year, our first dramatic series, Pendragon, to sweeten the deal like ice cream. We're also giving you up to 40% off select items in the Daily Wire shop. Take advantage of our President's for Sale sale today. You know he would. Just go to dailywire.com slash subscribe to become a member today. That's dailywire.com slash subscribe. Well, speaking of the religious impact of the cult of wokeism, they do require human sacrifice. They really do. And that has come in the form of literally taking children and then sacrificing them to the trans god. And it is... It is terrifying stuff. I mean, I talked yesterday about this amazing piece from a person named Jamie Reed over at Barry Weiss's The Free Press, thefp.com. You should go check it out, in which she talks about her experiences at the Washington University School of Medicine Division of Infectious Diseases, working with teens and young adults who are HIV positive, and then joining the Washington University Transgender Center at St. Louis Children's Hospital, where they basically mainlined kids directly into quote unquote gender affirming healthcare with like one appointment. Suddenly, kids were taking life altering drugs drugs that would sterilize them, drugs that would change their brain chemistry and all the rest. Well, now the consequences of this are becoming clear because of this whistleblower. The fact that it takes years for whistleblowers to come forward about the most obvious abuses I have ever seen is truly incredible. Why, first of all, why would it even take a whistleblower to know right off the bat that pretending that boys who think they are girls ought to be given heavy doses of estrogen and then prepped to have their penises and testicles removed from them and given breast implantation surgeries, that this was going to be the way to cure gender dysphoria or help those kids. And that teaching in widespread fashion across every school in the United States, the idea that boys can become girls and girls can become boys was going to be the solution here. That is such cultic nonsense rooted in a Gnostic belief that there is a complete soul-body duality, that you're a boy living in a girl's body as though there is the you and then there is the body and these are two completely separate things, right? In sort of a Cartesian fashion. Now, all of this is cultic garbage, but it became science. And then it was actually enacted on the bodies of children, on the bodies of minors, and now to celebrate it. And if you refuse to go along with this, then you are, then you are destroyed career-wise. People yell at you. Every college student must be forced to pay fealty to this cult, which is why when you enter a, a college 
orientation, the first thing they do is they now ask you your pronouns. You have to demonstrate that you have skin in the game for this cult. The consequences over the next few years are going to become very, very clear. We've already seen skyrocketing rates of mental illness. We have extraordinarily socially contagious rates of trans and queer identification. That has nothing to do with biology. That has everything to do with social contagion, and everyone knows it. But if you say that publicly, people get very, very angry at you, and the cult demands that you then be punished for your great sins. This is why I don't think Joe Biden's going to be able to escape all this stuff. And Joe Biden is going to want to talk about the John Edwards to America stuff in 2024. I don't think he's going to be able to. I think he's going to be on a debate stage and somebody's going to ask him, do you believe that boys can become girls? And he's going to have to answer yes. Somebody's going to ask him how many genders are there and he's going to have to answer infinite because otherwise his own base will go after him. And then he'll say that it's unsympathetic or, or cruel to children to not allow them to mutilate their bodies or for society not to go along with their delusions and instead to either watchfully wait or to try to inform them more properly, which is what any normal society would do. That in fact, your mental condition, the solution to that is not to chop body parts off or mutilate your body. But Joe Biden will be forced to answer those sorts of questions. Right now, the bill is already coming due. According to the UK Daily Mail, a St. Louis transgender treatment clinic is now under investigation for allegedly harming up to 600 children after a whistleblower claimed parents were bullied into allowing kids to take irreversible hormone drugs and undergo gender transitioning surgeries. Jamie Reed, that's the person we discussed yesterday, that former employee at the Washington University Transgender Center at the St. Louis Children's Hospital, told the Free Press the clinic administered a litany of irreparable treatments to minors, oftentimes without parental consent. Reed claims doctors would ask questions like, do you want a dead daughter or an alive son in order to bully children's parents into going ahead with gender transitions, which again, is a cultic behavior. And if you want to indoctrinate people in the cult, you say, would you like your kid to be happy in the cult or would you like your kid to be suicidal? Now, in reality, suicide rates among teenagers are skyrocketing. They have been for a while, and they're going to get worse. So you would assume that with, quote unquote, more trans acceptance, that would go down. That is not actually what is happening. Instead, the reverse is happening, again, because we are actively indoctrinating our children into a cult of gender dysmorphia and gender dysphoria. The whistleblower told the free press that working at the center was, quote, like I was in a cult, and I had to deprogram my way out of it. Reed alleged in a sworn affidavit that the hospital openly lied about not performing sex transitioning surgeries on minors, claiming that one doctor, Dr. Allison Snyder Warwick, performed one at the hospital in the last few years. Missouri Attorney General Andrew Bailey confirmed his office is now launching an investigation into the clinic following Reed's allegations, which he characterized as disturbing. Bailey said his primary goal was to make sure children were not harmed by individuals who may be more concerned with a radical social agenda than the health of children. In her affidavit, Reed said in one instance, a girl was prescribed cross-sex hormones because she didn't want to become pregnant. So she said, I don't want to be pregnant. So they gave her testosterone. This, this whistleblower says there was no need for this girl to be prescribed cross-sex hormones. What she needed was basic sex education and maybe contraception. But because the doctors automatically prescribe cross-sex hormones or puberty blockers for kids, meeting the bare minimum criteria, this girl is unnecessarily placed on drugs that cause irreversible change to the body. She alleged in another instance, a patient asked for their breasts to be removed and was given the surgery at St. Louis Children's Hospital. But weeks later, the woman asked for them to be put back on. But by the way, you see the sort of language used by the trans cult. They'll say things like, well, we can, we can stop puberty. We can always restart it. No problem. We can remove your breasts and then we can rebuild your breasts if you change your mind. That is not the way any of this works, guys. But the entire Democratic Party will be forced to perform acts of fealty to this cult, which is why Joe Biden is not going to be able to escape that track. This whistleblower said children come into the clinic using pronouns of inanimate objects like mushroom, rock, or helicopter. Children come into the clinic saying they want hormones because they do not want to be gay. Children come in changing their identities on a day-to-day -day basis. Children come in under clear pressure by a parent to identify in a way inconsistent with the child's actual identity. Yes, I mean, this is a major aspect here, is that because this cult has gone global and because it is media pushed and media celebrated, because of all of this, parents are now essentially engaging in Munchausen syndrome by proxy. They're transing their own kids, claiming that they are doing something virtuous for their kids, so that they can pat themselves on the back. It is not a coincidence that the rates of transgender identification are sky high in places like Los Angeles and New York and San Francisco, and they are minuscule in conservative areas of the country. That is not because of the evils of conservative areas. It's because of the social contagion fostered by the adults in these other arenas. So it'll be fascinating to see how uh, Democrats try to navigate this particular gap between the blue collar base that Joe Biden so desperately wants to seek and the radical gender base and, and race base that they've cultivated up till now. I'm not sure that, that gap is bridgeable and I think it's gonna come back to bite them in a pretty serious way.
Now, speaking of things that are biting in a rather serious way, John Fetterman is in the hospital again. Now, you'll recall that we were told that to raise his health, even though he had had a debilitating stroke in the middle of the campaign, was a sign of some sort of bigotry or vicious evil. As it turns out, he's now back in the hospital. The latest update is that he received the results of his MRI. And according to his doctors at the George Washington University Hospital, the results of the MRI, along with the results of all other tests the doctors ran, ruled out a new stroke. But he was being monitored with an EEG for signs of seizure. He was not, in fact, discharged last night. I will tell you, it is rather amazing, the media coverage here, because um, the media are trying to claim that he has been forced to do something beyond what normally a person in his condition would, would be doing. Well, yeah, he was. By, by whom? By whom? Like the, the, by the people around him? By his wife? By his political party? Like, this is not a person who is well. He should not be in this position. And then Carney in the New York Times at This AM writes, quote, his adjustment to serving in the Senate has been made vastly more difficult by the strains of his recovery, which left him with a physical impairment and serious mental health challenges that have rendered the transition extraordinarily challenging, even with the accommodations that have been made to help him adapt. But I, th I thought from the media that we weren't supposed to talk about that. I thought that he was totally fine, right? Well, wasn't everything fine? Apparently, the New York Times reports, quote, when it's bad, Mr. Fetterman has described his condition as trying to make out the muffled voice of the teacher in the Peanuts cartoon whose words could never be deciphered. Uh, our journalism media, man, are they good at their job. They made sure that he's in the Senate so that presumably his wife can eventually be the senator from, uh, from Pennsylvania. I also remind you at this point that Republicans should not have nominated Doug Mastriano for governor of Pennsylvania. It turns out that bad political decision-making has pretty bad consequences. Okay, meanwhile, the Twitter hearings continue in the, in the House. Congressional Republicans going after the former Twitter heads and pointing out that they are actively suppressing speech on behalf of Democrats, or we're doing so. This, of course, has led members of the media to celebrate that suppression of speech. One of the chief advocates for suppressing speech is Kara Swisher. I'll never forget that Kara Swisher literally asked the head of YouTube if it was possible to ban me from YouTube because her son was watching the show. It, this is the sort of person who is the media critic, like the tech critic over at the New York Times. Here's Kara Swisher yesterday saying, Twitter shouldn't even be investigated for shutting down speech that I don't like. After all, speech I don't like is, is speech I don't like. Please excuse my language. This is a direct quote, but Chrissy Teigen referred to Donald Trump as a. I mean, what uh -huh. a moment, Kara. Um, yeah. To say, we, oh, this happened, we... but not the way you thought it happened. That's correct. I'm glad we got to the bottom of this nonsense. I mean, this is ridiculous. What has been shown here is that uh, Twitter was was not really pressured, but they were contacted by everybody who wanted to influence what they were doing. But there was no conspiracy here. There was no anything except people trying to, to gain purchase. And in the case of this Hunter Biden thing, they denied it. This is not, there's no, they denied it. And so I think this was a waste of taxpayer money. It's a lot of nonsense. Well, she was very much in favor of them shutting down the Hunter Biden story at the time. And, and by the way, the, the sort of game that is played between the FBI and Twitter in this particular case is the Henry II will no one rid me of this meddlesome priest routine with regard to Thomas Beckett. And the, the, the notion being that the FBI doesn't actually have to say ban the Hunter Biden story. They just go, oh, there is a lot of Russian disinformation out there right now. Have you seen this Hunter Biden story? Have you seen that? I mean, there's a, you, you really need to crack down on disinformation. We're not saying that the Hunter Biden story is Russian disinformation, but it kind of like, have you seen a lot of Russian disinformation? And the Twitter heads are like, oh, okay, I guess we'll do what they want. The truth is that people on the left are very fond of Twitter censoring material because why wouldn't they be? Twitter, until Elon Musk, was censoring right-wing material almost exclusively. I mean, you had yesterday the incredible specter of a Democratic congresswoman literally saying that hate speech is not protected speech, which is a rather, this is Representative Plaskett, is a, a rather amazing statement considering that, that hate speech, she says hate speech and racist speech are not free speech and are not protected by the Constitution. Uh, wrong? The chair and his colleagues continually use the moniker of protecting free speech. That sounds good. I hope they all recognize that there is speech that is not constitutionally protected. Racist, hate, incitement to violence. And I also hope, and if the protection of true speech, of free speech, extends to all Americans. Uh, wrong. Just wrong. She's the Democratic representative from the uh, Virgin Islands. Uh, no, that is not even remotely close to correct. 
hate speech, racist speech, these are not categories in constitutional law. And in fact, speech that you consider hate speech or racist speech may in fact be perfectly non-hateful or racist because the Democrats have redefined those terms to encompass everything they don't particularly like. This is the reason why they are so protective of the former Twitter regime because they're very much in favor of censorship and they were working hand in glove in order to achieve that censorship. Okay, time for some things I like and then some things that I hate. So things that I like today. There's a clip that went viral yesterday of a vice panel. So vice does these panels of various young people talking about politics. And uh, this particular panel was extraordinarily amusing because you can see the woke in action, like in full action. In this particular clip, there's a young Asian man who is talking about how Asians outperform, economically speaking, they have really low crime rates and why that is. And the shock and, and utter kind of disdain that everyone else on the panel has for this person saying perfectly obvious things, it's amazing because they just assume everybody around them is going to agree that it must be some form of white privilege or racism that is to blame for this. Here is, uh, th this clip is an amazing clip. Here we go. Statistically, it is true that Asians, right, on average, make more money, it, like in terms of medium, make more money, better test scores, get into better colleges, all that stuff. I think the question is, why is that? And I don't know if model minority, whatever that label wants That's to That's actually mean. a not, myth because not, we cannot be- um, Well, no, listen, well, let me finish my point. We need to observe what makes people successful and unsuccessful. And I think when you look at trends that are generally true in the Asian community, not of everyone, but are generally true, usually you have families that are sticking together. You have, um, you know, people are taught to work hard in school, not get into trouble. I think that translates to why Asians en masse are successful. And I don't think you have to be Asian or white for that matter to not have kids out of wedlock, not, you know, commit crime, not, not cause trouble, what whatever happening? it is. It's just a matter of like, well, common sense. That's what makes people successful. I love the faces of the people around him. He's saying perfectly obvious things. There's great social science data to suggest this is the case. That if you wish to be successful in American life, you basically need to do three things. Graduate high school, don't have a baby out of wedlock, get a job. Those are the three things. If you do that, then you will not be permanently poor in the United States. Like we're talking 98% of the time. The, the ladder of success is actually pretty available to most people if you make basic responsible decisions and communities that tend to value education and family and where mom and dad are both present and where a lot of time is spent in school and where people put a lot of focus on studying. Of course, those cultures are going to do better. And that has nothing to do with race. The guy says it has nothing to do with race and all these people are just freaking out. You got purple haired lady who is Asian making the, making the, the I can't believe I'm hearing this face. You have uh, a, a guy who also appears to be uh, maybe Indian or Pakistani who's just freaking out. How, how could someone say, did you just say people shouldn't have, be single parent? You, you said people should get married? Oh my God, oh my God. You have uh, a, another Asian guy sitting next to this Asian guy and he's just he's so uncomfortable, deeply uncomfortable. It, like, amazing, amazing stuff. But again, you are not allowed in the cult, when you're in the cult of racial equity or gender identity, anyone who questions the cult must be treated as though what they're saying is absolute anathema. That it's insane. It's insane to suggest that personal agency has something to do with your success or failure in life. That is the thing that the left can't stand more than anything else. And that is where, you know, you wonder where wokeism crosses streams with the rest of the left-wing agenda. I mean, the answer is that the entire basis of wokeism springs from a sort of Marxist theory, which is that people are not responsible for their own decisions, that all failures in your life are due to some sort of evil capitalist or traditionalist mindset that has been imbued throughout society. And if you obliterate those structures, then everybody will finally be equal. Everybody will bloom anew. That is where they cross streams, is, is lack of personal responsibility and blaming society for all of your problems. That's really where, where the, the, the commonality lies. Whenever anyone suggests that personal responsibility is the answer to 92% of all of your problems in life, 92% is a low-end estimate, man, that the vast majority of your problems are solvable by you. If we're not talking about a debilitating health crisis, if you're a sentient human, the vast majority of your own problems are solvable by you. First of all, the fact that there are people out there who find that enervating is shocking to me. That should be the most energizing idea ever. It's saying that you can actually succeed if you take your life in hand. That is a much better outlook on life than society is victimizing me. And you see that guy over there who's having a bad life? It's probably because society is victimizing him as well. You can have sympathy for your fellow human being to give them a hand up or, or help them out, give charity, give people jobs and do all those things. And that's a good thing to do. 
But the reality is that the person won't take the job because they're busy complaining about how society is victimizing them. Well, there's not much you can do about that. When you have a person saying common sense things and everybody reacting like this, it is an indicator of where we are going as a society. So good for this guy on this vice panel. And I have to say the reactions are absolutely hilarious, which brings us to a quick thing that I hate. So speaking of systems that actually are failing people, the president of the United States declared in his State of the Union address earlier this week that he would like to see two additional years of education tacked on to the 12 years that we already have, or 13 years K through 12. Um, there's only one problem with that, which is that our schools are already failing. According to Fox Baltimore, after Fox 45's Project Baltimore report uncovered 23 schools in Baltimore City had zero students, zero, 23 schools, zero students who tested profession in math. Some leaders representing the city aren't talking about the problem. The Maryland State Department of Education recently released the 2022 state test results known as MCAP. That's the Maryland Comprehensive Assessment Program. Baltimore City's math scores were the lowest in the state. 7% of third through eighth graders tested proficient in math. 7%, 93% of students could not do math at grade level. Project Baltimore analyzed the test results, found 23 schools, including elementary, middle, and high schools, that didn't have one student performing at grade level. There were another 20 schools that had only one or two students testing proficient in math. The alarming test results underscored the concern for student achievement in Baltimore City. Fox 45 News and Project Baltimore sent questions to the city council and Baltimore City delegation in Annapolis demanding answers as to who should be held responsible. And pretty much nobody responded. Which is not, of course, a shock because you have to keep dumping money into the failing system. And you can never, you can never claim the other possibility, which is that maybe parenting strategies in the city of Baltimore are failing because a huge percentage of families in the city of Baltimore are led by non-two-parent families. And that is a problem, as it turns out. That lack of education and lack of focus on education in the home is a serious, serious issue. And that bleeds over into school no matter how much money you dump into the schools. Plus, the schools themselves are failing. This ties into the whole lack of, of personal responsibility, lack of agency that our society propagates. And, and then we blame ghosts in the machine, like systemic racism for failures in Baltimore, which again is a largely black city in which nearly all the public officials are black and in which the failures just continue. That is not systemic racism at work. That is bad decision-making. And it is, it is a lack of focus on the things that actually should matter to kids, both in the home and in the institutions. Speaking of lack of personal responsibility and attempts to blame global forces for individual decision-making, another terrorist attack over in Israel today, a six-year-old child and a man in his 20s were killed. Five others were injured in a terrorist ramming attack near the remote neighborhood of Jerusalem on Friday afternoon. The terrorist, identified as Hossein Karaka, a 31-year-old resident of East Jerusalem, rammed into a bus stop at the entrance of the remote neighborhood. He just drove his bus, direct, he drove his car directly into a bus stop. A Facebook account reportedly belonging to, a, to the terrorist posted a series of posts in recent months glorifying both Hezbollah, which is a Lebanese terror group, that has presence in, uh, in the Palestinian areas, and Palestinian terrorists, including a post calling a terrorist who conducted a shooting attack at the Shuafa checkpoint last year a hero. Meanwhile, presumably, any retaliation undertaken by the Israeli government will be condemned by the international community because agency only applies to the people we don't like. It's amazing. If you're on the right, you say agency applies to everybody. Everybody has personal agencies. Don't do evil things. Don't do evil things. The solution to whatever your problems are are not, in fact, ramming a, a truck into a couple of school children at a bus stop. On the left, agency is only something that you apply to your enemies. You have no agency. Your enemy has agency. And so if your enemy retaliates against you, it's because they are bad. They are utilizing their agency to do something to you. And it's through no fault of your own because you didn't have agency. So you don't actually deserve anything that's happening to you. This is the way logic seems to work in the Middle East. You have one side that hands out candies when children are run over by a car. And you have another side that kills terrorists and the left wing media in the United States treat the two things as equivalent or the Israeli retaliation as significantly worse against terrorists than the actual terror attack carried out against innocent civilians. All right, guys, the rest of the show continues right now. You're not going to want to miss it. We'll get into your questions in the mailbag. Remember, you have to be a subscriber in order to get your question answered in the mailbag. Become a member. Use code Shapiro at checkout for two months free on all annual plans. Click the link in the description and join us. 